Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. If you're in the US afternoon or evening, if you're elsewhere. Uh, welcome to the University of Texas at Austin. This is uh, our second, uh, perhaps annual, uh, PhD student symposium on financial market research and policy developments. Uh, I'm Scott Bogus. I'm a director at the Salem Center for Policy at the Macomb School of Business. Uh, this is a two day event. Uh, it's the second time we're running it. Uh, the goal is to help PhD students further develop their research programs and in particular through the lens of financial market policy. Uh, somewhat unique to this program is you'll be hearing from uh, leading researchers and officials, not just from academia, but government uh, and also industry. Uh, and each day we're going to have two uh, plenary sessions and four special track sessions. The plenary sessions are topics aimed at overarching issues relevant to all areas of financial markets. Uh, and the special tracks are areas of financial market policy activity. Uh, so the topics are what is current and relevant in financial markets. Each uh, special track has accepted uh, some student papers. We had a number of extremely good ones. Um, and they'll be followed by panel discussions on the general trends and issues uh, in each of these financial uh, market areas. Um, so the general rules of engagement before we get started, uh, if you've made it this far, I assume you have all the links, that's great. Um, for the special track sessions, we encourage you to stay face on. Um, there'll be smaller sessions in the plenary sessions. Uh, and whether it's a plenary session or a special track session, we encourage you uh, to ask questions. So moderators will be fielding questions and feeding them to the panelists. Uh, don't be shy. In the plenary sessions, uh, please use the Q&A function. In the special track function, in the special session, special track sessions, uh, please use the uh, chat function. So Q&A for plenary, chat for special sessions. Um, and without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our uh, first plenary panel. Uh, the title is Research and Public Policy, a discussion of bank regulation, corporate taxes, and ESG. The moderator of this panel is Sheridan Titman. He's the Walter McAllister Centennial Chair of Financial Services and also the Chair of the Finance Department, the Macomb School of Business. Um, so Sheridan, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Um, we're very much looking forward to this panel. Um, the, the four of us um, on this panel um, enjoyed doing it last year. So we're very much looking forward to doing it again. Um, I've got three extremely good panelists. Um, Tobias Adrian, um, he's the Director of Monetary and Capital Markets at the IMF. Um, prior to being at the IMF, he was a Senior Vice President and Director, or I guess Associate Director of the Research and Statistics Group at the New York Fed. Um, Jeremy Stein is a professor at Harvard. I think he's still the Department Chair. Um, no longer the Department Chair, Jeremy. Well, I would congratulate you on that. The former department chair, that's a title that I've always wanted to have as former department chair um, at the Harvard Economics Department. Um, and um, he was also the former, um, a former governor of the um, Federal Reserve's um, Board of Governors. And um, our third panelist is Jim Paterba. Jim has been a professor at MIT for about as long as I've known him, definitely as long as I've known him. And he is the president of the NBER. Okay, so we're going to start with Jim. And Jim um, is going to start us off um, with a brief discussion on um, taxes and um, economic policy. So, um, Jim, go ahead. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with this group once again and to welcome the, the students who are joining us today. One illustration of how quickly the research terrain can change, uh, when we gathered just a year ago, uh, the issue of corporate tax reform was, uh, was one where it was in the rear view mirror possibly. We were thinking about, well, what were the consequences of the major tax reform in the US of 2017? Uh, but it wasn't one of the topics we talked about on the panel. But in the last year, uh, particularly the last seven months, we have seen tremendous activity globally on corporate tax reform. And one of the major objectives of Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen has been to try to move the, the, the global developed economies toward a new regime 
in which there would be some harmonization of corporate tax provisions and an attempt to raise revenue from many of the major large multinational companies. Uh, so I'm going to take that as my prompt for this morning. I, I should note that within corporate finance, uh, you know, taxation has long been a topic of interest. Uh, both Sharon and I share a, a substantial research interest in this area, and there are longstanding questions like the role of corporate taxation for corporate debt choice uh, and, and leverage decisions. Uh, of course, the level of corporate taxes matter for the after-tax cash flows that we all think about discounting when trying to figure out the value of corporate assets. And as tax rates change, those, those after-tax cash flows can also change. So the tax system is actually fundamentally uh, linked up with, with major decisions in corporate finance. But the, the, uh, the, the rapid evolution of the tax system is something that happens only every now and then. All right, so I'm going to speak, speak a bit about the global dimensions of tax reform at the moment, and then if I have time, say a little bit about the domestic side as well. I, I'm going to start by, by just showing you a, a slide that illustrates what's happened to corporate income tax revenue in the U.S. This is part of the motivating story for, uh, gee, we need to do something about the corporate tax in the U.S. Uh, in, in the late 1950s, we were collecting around 4% of, of GDP in corporate income tax revenue. Today, that number is closer to 1%. And uh, if you think that history is some guide, some folks would get disturbed by, by what's happening here. And, and the first question is just what's happened? You know, what, why have we seen this change? And at, at, a, at a very simple level, there are two things that have happened. The size of the corporate sector relative to the US economy has changed because of, we've seen a growth of non-corporate businesses in the US. So the, the, the base has actually changed. But it's also true that the rates that we levy on corporate income as taxes have gone down. Uh, this just shows the distribution, not just for the U.S., but for the, 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 global, uh, the, the global collection of, of major countries, uh, focusing on what's happened to corporate tax rates, statutory corporate rates, uh, since about 40 years ago. And what you can see is that in 1980, you know, the central tendency here was in the, the, the low to mid 40s. Uh, today, the number is in the low to mid 20s. And if you just said, well, all right, we cut the rate in half, uh, not surprisingly, the, the revenue might have gone down. And then you give me a little extra for changing the size of the corporate sector and you get from four to one. Uh, but what is, what is happening that's putting the pressure on this move from you know, the 40s to the 20s? And I think it's actually fundamentally tied up with the nature of business activity and the nature of what is happening in the, in the corporate sector. In 1970, the five largest companies in the US by market cap uh, were IBM, General Motors, AT&T, what's now Exxon, and Eastman Kodak. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Eastman Kodak used to make a thing called camera, uh, which was something that we used before we had phones. Uh, but uh, those companies, with the possible exception of AT&T, all made products that you know, were typically, they were manufacturing firms for the five, and you could identify where they produced, and you could rather clearly identify uh, where they sold as well. Today, the five largest not market cap companies are Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook. Right? They are not manufacturing firms. It is much more difficult to identify, here's where the car was produced, here was the, here's where the refinery is, and they have global customer bases. And importantly, as a number of recent papers within corporate finance have pointed to, intellectual property and intangible assets are much more important to these firms than they were for the firms of 40 or 50 years ago. The result is that these firms have much more discretion in locating globally where the returns to their activities will accrue. And if you can locate your pharma company and in intellectual property, your patents in Ireland, if you can locate the patents associated with some of your software in other low tax jurisdictions, then arguably you can move around where the profits are earned in a way which will lower the tax burden on the overall corporate enterprise. And it is precisely that capacity on the firm side, which has put pressure on governments to compete with each other as a, in, a, in, in what seems like a bit of a race to the bottom to try to lower corporate tax rates and therefore hang on to some of the revenue and avoid the opportunity, avoid firms taking advantage of these opportunities to move their, 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 tax, their tax base offshore. Uh, there are basically two different strategies one can pursue in trying to uh, tackle this problem. One is to essentially regulate and to bring the playbook that we use in financial and other regulation to bear, and it, this links up with some of the other comments this morning, on trying to identify where the firms have earned their income and limit the ability of the firms to move IP or other activities offshore. The other strategy is to try to change what we tax from the corporate sector, 
and move away from taxing the point of production, which is much more difficult to, to, to identify in these, intellect, in, in these intellectual property-oriented businesses, <clears throat> and to move toward taxing the point of sale. It is much easier to figure out where customers are than it is to figure out where the ultimate points in the production chain are uh, that generated value. And therefore, the, the global economy is facing, in some sense, a choice of how to tackle these problems. What, what, what the G20 has been trying to do is to harmonize, put in place minimum taxes, which would essentially lower the incentive for firms to try to move their, their intellectual property and their profits across, across, across country-level borders. Uh, and other proposals developed at the OECD and, and in other jurisdictions are, are pushing toward a, a customer-oriented, what I would call a destination-based tax system, which looks a lot more like, say, a value-added tax or retail sales tax on firms, uh, but is ultimately designed to try to tax the, the profits and the earnings of the, of the corporate enterprise. So the future that we face is trying to navigate how to collect revenue from the corporate actors while recognizing that they have much greater flexibility today than in the past. This, by the way, as a set of research questions, brings in issues of game theoretic interactions between jurisdictions, as well as traditional regulations. And it actually brings in issues from financial regulation, as well as traditional tax policy, as we think about how to address some of these questions. The other brief comment I'll make in, in just a minute is related to the, the changing nature of the, the US corporate sector. Uh, and this is just a slide that shows you the fraction of net business income in the US that is reported by traditional C corporations that file corporate income tax returns and by pass through entities like partnerships and S corporations, individual proprietorships, what you see is over time, there's been a significant change and today the pass through entities are larger than the C corps. The pass through entities don't pay corporate income tax. Okay? And for decades, corporate finance and tax accountants and tax economists have been pointing out that a key challenge in the corporate sector is that the income is double taxed. It's taxed by the corporate income tax, then it's taxed when it's paid out as dividends or received by the individuals who own the, or, or the investors potentially as capital gains. Well, one way, from, one way out of the double tax box is not to be a corporation at all, but to be something like a partnership, which gets taxed only once at the individual tax level. And that is precisely what's happened over time particularly starting in the mid-1980s when tax reform in the U.S. moved the relative tax rates uh, lower on individuals and therefore made it even more attractive to be a, a pass-through entity. In 2017, and I'm gonna, not going to address that in any depth, in 2017, we moved the tax rate on some pass-through entities down to a level as low as 21%. Uh, while still taxing uh, you know, in other kinds of individual income at higher rates, creating new incentives for, uh, for using this channel. So I think the, the, the lesson that this raises is that what I'll call the, the organizational form question, how business is organized as a C-corp versus a, a pass-through entity is very important in understanding not just taxes, but other issues as well. So let me stop with that kind of overview of the corporate tax issues, and I'm sure we'll have more time to come back in the Q&A. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Um, and we'll definitely have lots of time to go back to this. Um, let's move on to Jeremy and talk a little bit more about financial policy and financial innovation. Jeremy? Okay, yeah, well, thanks, thanks, Sheridan, and thanks for having me back. It's, it's very nice to be back here. What I thought I would do is make uh, some brief remarks about a couple of topics in financial regulation that seem to be on the front burner for policymakers uh, sort of at the moment. And I, I should say both of them are about aspects of non-bank um, uh, financial regulation. And you know, loosely, you can think about that, that in the wake of the global financial crisis, a lot of effort was devoted to bank regulation. And to the extent that there are holes remaining, many of those holes kind of uh, are, are now outside of the, the banking sector. So the two things I wanted to touch on are first, the treasury market, and second, open-end funds, open-end bond funds and loan funds in particular. So with treasuries, the, the sort of obvious motivation comes, and I, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, uh, from the market turmoil in the treasury market that we saw in March of last year, uh, as the pandemic was just really starting to, to hit home, there was a sort of very dramatic spike in treasury yields, enormous illiquidity in what is arguably the world's most um, important market and a, and a general concern that as the stock of treasury securities continues to grow, as, as government uh, uh, runs large deficits, these problems are gonna become potentially even worse. So I was just very recently involved in a report uh, 
that was put out by something called the Group of 30, it was led by Tim Geithner, that made up a, a series of recommendations for uh, reforms to the, to the treasury market. And I thought I would just highlight a couple of the things that we, we touched on. The first uh, is the idea of something called a standing repo facility. This is the idea that the Federal Reserve would basically announce ahead of time that they are prepared to lend against, um, against treasuries, again, you know, on a collateralized basis against treasury securities um, uh, at, any, at any time. Um, and so we, we, announced, we sort of endorsed this idea. In fact, the Fed has come out and said that they are gonna do this. I just wanted to highlight one crucial difference here, which is that the Fed has said that they will lend only to the so-called primary dealer community. Whereas in our, in our report, we recommended that the facility have much broader access. Um, essentially anybody, think of it as a mutual fund or a hedge fund, who had treasury securities in our formulation would be able to bring them to the Fed and, 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 and get, get cash in return. And our thinking on this was as follows. If you think about what happened in March, 2020, there was very, a, a lot of the selling came from non-bank actors and mutual funds and hedge funds were among the leading sellers of treasury securities. The thought is if they knew that they had access to the ability to monetize, to get cash, by borrowing against these securities, they wouldn't have to be in such a rush to sell them. They could sit tight knowing that they could always go to the Fed and basically get the cash that they need. Um, so the problem with the narrow access facility that the Fed has proposed is you're then counting on the idea that the Fed will lend to a small group of primary dealers who then in turn will turn around and lend to the hedge funds and the mutual funds of the world. Okay, but what we've seen, and this is particularly true in moments of, of stress, is that that on lending doesn't always happen. That the primary dealers or other kind of market players are constrained either by something called the leverage ratio or by their own risk models from turning around, expanding their balance sheet and doing the lending. So that's why we believe it's sort of important to have the Fed. Of course, this is only, this is not the idea that the Fed lends against all kinds of stuff only against treasury securities should lend basically much more, much, much more broadly. Um, and we have some other ideas in there. I'll, 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 I'll stop with that. And of course, I want to be clear, there's no pretense or no, no supposition that doing this is, is a panacea, especially for the sort of very intense kind of problems um, that we saw in March, 2020. We think it sort of has the, the, the potential to make things a little bit better but, but um, there are deeper rooted problems here. In terms of sort of the research agenda, I think abstracting away from many of the sort of details of market structure, I think a fundamental problem here is that the business of market making, if you're in the business of being a market maker in treasury securities, 99 days out of 100, it's very efficient to do that with very little capital. Okay, and we've had, you know, the, the traditional bank market makers have been in significant part displaced by high frequency traders who operate with very little capital. They're very efficient at kind of minimizing bid ask spreads on a minute to minute basis. And that basically works well and markets are liquid 99 days out of 100. And the evolutionary pressure is gonna be towards this kind of capital light model. But that model does not work well the one day out of 100 when there are very, very large flows and you need more risk absorption capacity. But the market mechanism basically doesn't really put pressure on, on the system to have that sort of additional uh, amount of capital. And there's nothing really in what we're doing and in many of the other recommendations that I've seen that addresses that. So while again, I think we can, we can do some, you know, there, there, there's sort of straightforward ways to be helpful around the edges. I think this is gonna continue to be both a policy challenge in an area where there's gonna be some, some interesting uh, research to be done. So that was the first thing. The second thing I wanted to very briefly touch on is the issue of open-end funds. Think of these as mutual funds that invest in illiquid or relatively illiquid things. Think of this as like junk bonds or leveraged loans or the like. Um, you know, a number of observers have for many years been concerned that this is sort of a fragile setup that you have basically relatively illiquid assets uh, 
you know, on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, and yet the ability for investors to withdraw their money uh, on a daily basis. And I think some of these concerns were, were sort of underscored by events in March where there were tremendous outflows um, from these mutual funds. And in fact, some of, the, some of the selling pressure in the treasury market came from these mutual funds trying to get out of their most liquid assets, um, trying to get out of their most liquid assets first. Now, you know, unfortunately for empirical science, um, the Fed kind of spoiled the experiment because they stepped in and basically, you know, uh, stemmed the run by, by uh, opening their, their credit facilities, which, which had a very powerful effect. Um, as a result, I don't think we, we saw the full extent of the damage that could have come about had the Fed not stepped in. And I think potentially, unfortunately for policy, some of the urgency around this uh, may have, uh, around reforming this, this sector may have been lost. Um, but you know, assuming it's not, what would you ideally like to do? There's been some very, very good academic work making the point that in these sorts of funds, there's a, there's a bank run like first mover advantage. The idea being, if you have essentially 95% of your assets in illiquid stuff, and then 5% in treasuries or something like that, the first person who withdraws, the fund will meet that withdrawal by, by liquidating treasury securities. So they, there's no pressure yet put on the corporate bonds. And so the net asset value of the fund doesn't decline by much. Okay? But eventually, as the withdrawals build, they're going to have to start selling the less liquid stuff. At that point, the net, net asset value will fall. And at that point, those who withdraw will get out on worse terms. So we know basically that when there are outflows today, that reliably, and this is what's been shown in the work, that reliably predicts a decline in net asset values going forward. And that predictability is the source of a first mover advantage. You know that if you get out early, you're gonna get out on better terms than those who get out late. Okay, so that's, that's one reason that these things have, a, have sort of a public policy problem or an externality. If that is your diagnosis, the, the cure in some sense is somewhat straightforward. And this has been talked about a lot. There's the idea of what's called swing pricing. So that when I get out, when I sell, maybe there's a 1% fee or something like that that forces me to internalize, uh, in some sense, the cost, the liquidity cost that I'm imposing on those who remain behind. So that's a popular idea. There is, in fact, already swing pricing in other jurisdictions, uh, Europe and others. And even industry like BlackRock and others have gotten behind the idea of swing prices. So that's something that's kind of out there on the policy front. I guess the question I would raise, and I think this is sort of a very important question for research, the, the sort of academic work has also focused on this very particular bank run-like first mover advantage. My instinct is that while that's important, that is not the whole story. And it's not the only source of fragility in these funds. There's a variety of other mechanisms, whether you want to call it kind of positive feedback trading or um, stop loss or margin calls that also basically create uh, a feedback loop from people getting out to prices declining to more people getting out. And if those are kind of also important mechanisms, swing pricing, while helpful, is unlikely to be a, enough of a panacea to, to sort of really um, you know, make these things as stable as we would like them to be. And again, as a research point, a very interesting contrast that I think deserves more attention is the contrast between open-end funds on the one hand and exchange-traded funds on the, on the other. Exchange-traded funds, if you thought the first mover advantage was really the whole thing, you really like exchange-traded funds because what they have is essentially an endogenous swing pricing mechanism when a lot of people try to get out, the price of the ETF falls relative to the net asset value. So you as the exiting investor are forced to eat your own price pressure. There's exactly that internalization mechanism. But if you look at the data, and I've done this only on a sketchy basis, if you look at the data, there were also in March, 2020, dramatic outflows from ETFs, as well as from bond funds, suggesting that forcing people to eat their price pressure may be helpful, but it's far from sufficient in terms of stemming this kind of, um, this kind of liquidation spiral. So I think sort of an open question, how severe this problem is beyond the first mover advantage, 
And if so, what would be the optimal design? Um, I think there's some people who, who, who raise the, the, the issue, you know, should we even be able to have open ending uh, or should we have only be able to have a very limited form of open ending with illiquid assets? I don't know the answer. I think it's a good question to be, uh, to be devoting some attention. Let me, let me stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Jeremy. And um, the third topic that we're going to be discussing today is um, ESG investing and um, and Tobias will talk in particular about climate issues. Tobias? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Sheridan, and uh, thanks for having me again at this panel. Um, so um, the number of asset managers and asset owners that are signatories to the principles of responsible investment, PRI, uh, has more than doubled in the past five years from about 1,500 to over 3,800 uh, as of now. And so together they manage about 100, $120 trillion of assets. So remember that global GDP is about 80 trillion. Um, so uh, 120 trillion total assets are managed subject to these principles for responsible investment, which is one way to think about uh, ESG investment. Now, of course, ESG uh, covers a, a huge array of uh, considerations, including social and governance uh, issues. So I will focus today, as Sheridan pointed out, on just one dimension, which is uh, climate change. And I think uh, there's a general recognition that uh, you know, this is a first order policy objective that uh, pretty much everybody uh, has to focus on. And um, you know, in, in policy making space at the moment, you see a tremendous amount of momentum on these climate issues at the global level. So uh, whether you look at the FSB uh, uh, that is sort of comprising all of the uh, standard setters or whether you look at the private sector, uh, there is just tremendous momentum on uh, climate finance. Um, so let me talk specifically on the potential of climate finance to make a difference for climate change mitigation. Uh, and uh, then I will, I will explain what the necessary policy steps are uh, to get there. Uh, you know, clearly the world is at a crossroad. Uh, you probably all saw uh, on Monday uh, the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, put out a pretty, pretty uh, uh, stark warning. Um, you know, global warming of one and a half to two percent. Um, you know, will will be exceeded unless dramatic reductions in CO two and other greenhouse gases uh, occur. Uh, for example, for a fifty percent chance for a 50% chance to limit global warming to one and a half percent above the pre-industrial levels, we have up to 500 billion of tons uh, of CO2 uh, left to consume, okay? So to limit to one and a half percent or less uh, and have a 50% chance of doing that, you can spend only 500 billion of CO2, but at the moment we are emitting about 40 billion a year. So we would reach that level uh, you know, within a very short amount of time. So limiting global warming can only be achieved through very deep economic transformations. And uh, this is clearly where capital markets are going to be a uh, very first order. I mean, unless capital markets play along, this is not uh, going to happen. Um, and, um, you know, many uh, are trying to get net zero by 2050. Um, and, you know, this is going to require a massive amount of investment uh, at the IMF, we estimate that that is about 12 to $20 trillion of investment cumulatively uh, in order to get to net zero, right? So tremendous funding needs here. Now, of course, economists generally argue that a global tar carbon tax is the optimal uh, way to go from a policy perspective. Um, and, you know, uh, at the IMF, we, we estimate that something like a $75 uh, price uh, per ton of carbon is, is the right uh, uh, floor. Um, uh, the actual price at the moment is $3 per ton. Okay, so you have to get from $3 to $75. You know, that is like magnitudes, uh, magnitudes different, 25 times. Um, and of course, the political acceptance to do that is, is extremely uh, challenging. Uh, 
um, you know, I, as an economist, this is what you want to do. But politically, it's going to be very unlikely to pass. And um, so uh, as, a, as, a, as a result, um, the financial sector might have to do its part uh, to get to uh, uh, better outcomes on the climate front. And so what we're seeing at the moment is uh, a tremendous momentum, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, investing in sustainable funds. Um, so that is one of the fastest growing uh, segments uh, in the investment universe. Uh, net flows into climate labeled funds have increased by a staggering eight, 48%, 48% of assets under management over uh, the past four quarters, over the four quarters of 2020. Okay, within 2020, 48% increase uh, of, of net flows uh, into uh, sustainable funds. And so clearly uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has raised investor awareness, right? So you've seen this catastrophe uh, due to the pandemic, and perhaps that has made people realize that a climate catastrophe that would be that much worse by any expectation, you know, is something that needs to be focused on. So sustainable finance and climate finance, however, is still very small. Okay, so when you look at the investment fund industry, that's about fifty trillion dollars uh, globally. Okay, fifty trillion dollars, and sustainable funds are about three trillion of those fifty trillion. But climate-focused funds are only about one hundred thirty billion, and so that is way too small uh, to make a difference. And so uh, this gets me uh, to the policy uh, considerations. So, what does the sector need uh, to grow more? Um, so, number one are data gaps. Um, so there is, um, you know, a lot of uh, uncertainty as to how much emissions uh, firms actually produce. Um, and, you know, there are some disclosure standards, uh, but uh, there's no unification of, of disclosure uh, on, on uh, climate data. Secondly, there's a lack of globally accepted taxonomies i.e. what does it mean to be green versus brown or so? So how does an investor know when an investment is actually a green and when your investor money actually makes a difference for climate? That's uh, the second issue. So what we need to do are three things. Number one, generate high quality, reliable and comparable data um, across firms and across countries. Number two, uh, have a, a, a climate disclosure standard. So uh, basically agree upon what firms have to disclose in terms of uh, what, what uh, they are doing in terms of uh, you know, climate mitigation or, or, or pollution. And thirdly, uh, there have to be uh, accepted principles for climate finance taxonomy. There's a, there's a huge amount of, of heterogeneity out there at the moment. And you know, some of the issues uh, that we see at the moment are, are greenwashing, for example, right? So where firms are not really green, but they manage to get green labels. Um, and uh, of course, financial incentives to boost capital flows towards sustainable finance, you know, have to be very clear. And it's not, it's not that easy at the moment to get there. Um, and so, you know, one particularly important initiative that happens everywhere but in the US uh, is uh, what the IFRS, the uh, International um, Financial Standards uh, uh, Organization. So those are the ones that are coming up with the accounting standard for the world, for every country but the US. Uh, but FASB, which is the US equivalent, is probably going to uh, be aligned very closely with what the IFRS is doing. And so they are working on um, enterprise level uh, sustainability reporting standards. So there's sort of like, we, we will eventually see an accounting system uh, on climate issues, very similar to, to financial accounting. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, there, there's, as I said at the beginning, there's tremendous uh, 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 momentum in this direction, uh, but of course there's a large uh, way to go. So, um, you know, in terms of, you know, PhD uh, thinking and research uh, ideas, I think, um, you know, the, the role of, of sustainable finance for moving to a greener economy is, is a first order policy question. Uh, 
um, there are lots of questions about, you know, valuations, asset pricing, risk premium, climate risk premium, brown versus green risk premium, etc. There's also a lot of interest in climate risk modeling. Uh, so insurance companies have done a lot of that for physical risk for many years, but there's also transition risk. So as economies are transitioning uh, towards a greener structure, what is happening to relative asset prices? Um, and of course, uh, finally incorporating um, sustainability objectives in macrofinancial models, you know, is really at the very beginning. There's a couple of papers on that out there, but uh, you know, that's a tremendously rich and, and important area as well. So uh, let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've, I'll start with a couple of questions and then we'll um, just sort of um, have fairly um, loose um, ranging questions from all of us. So uh, don't feel shy about interrupting um, any of us and we'll, we'll try to have a free form conversation, but let's start with you, Jim, um, taxes. And I think taxes actually have a lot to do with um, the issues that Jeremy talked about and obviously the issues that um, Tobias talked about. But let me start with a sort of a very big picture question for Jim, and then maybe we can all sort of chime in on this. Uh, what I found extremely striking from your talk, Jim, was that the amount of money being raised from the corporate tax, from corporate taxes is extremely small, not much more than 1%. Now, given that the cost of collecting those taxes is quite high, we've got a huge industry of accountants that are calculating taxes and the IRS is basically sitting in the corporation's offices to some extent, um, you know, going over all these numbers, the cost of compliance is extremely high. And um, as we've all studied, there's a lot of distortions associated with these taxes. So I guess my question is, is this even worth the bother uh, for collecting 1% on revenue? You know, maybe we should just eliminate the corporate taxes. Have you given that much thought? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, Sheridan. And I think there are two, there are two interrelated answers. Uh, the first is that uh, the corporate income tax in whatever form it takes serves in some sense as a backstop to the rest of the tax system, right? In, you know, I, I will say to my, you know, to, to my academic colleagues and aspiring academics on this call, right? If, if we went to a world in which corporate income was not taxed, uh, I have a feeling that many of my more entrepreneurial colleagues would uh, incorporate themselves and their lectures at their universities would be income to their corporate activity, uh, not to their individual uh, activities anymore. And if the corporate burden, the corporate tax burden was, was very low, there'd be a lot of tax evasion opportunities which would involve moving activities into the corporate sector that might otherwise be, say, in the individual or the personal sector. All right, so I think that's a but, sentiment that, you have to what, but Jim, we'd have some sort of system where everything would flow through to your um, personal income. Yeah, um, I mean, what, what, you'd, what you'd essentially create would be the opportunity for what we'd call inside buildup, right, in, in, a, in a corporate sector shell uh, that if, you're, if your income, your earnings, as it were, were higher than your, your consumption needs, you'd have unlimited IRA type opportunities to be able to build up assets in some corporate, um, corporate entity, right? And that, that could raise some, some complicated uh, compliance issues. I think the other, the other part of the answer, Sheridan, which is important is that many of the, the, the what, what I'll call the destination-based tax solutions, the kind that say my, my good friend, Alan Auerbach at Berkeley and Mike Dever and Oxford and others have been advocating for, which would, which would essentially look to some degree like a value-added tax uh, but uh, you know, value-added taxes is a tax which allows you to deduct at every point in the production stage the costs of your input. And typically, we allow deductions for the costs of you know goods and services you need to purchase to make your product, as well as uh, and 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 that's the the one thing. So that the usual VAT effectively is a tax on labor as you're working along. It ultimately ends up as a as a sales tax. But what a number of people like Alan have argued for is essentially a VAT which allows you to deduct the cost of labor along the way through. So it becomes more of a, a tax just on the capital side of what you're producing, but it's still collected ultimately at the point of sale by, by, by working through the production chain. And I think that the, you know, that, that is a destination-based approach 
It's one that avoids, just as we don't see a lot of race to the bottom in, in value-added taxes, right? They seem reasonably stable across the, 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 the developed world. Uh, the, the sort of destination-oriented corporate tax structure, which with, a, with an exemption of labor income along the way, is much more progressive than a traditional value-added tax. That looks like a, a, a sort of structure that may well have some, some opportunities to work, to, to work going forward. And I think that would still want to you know, preserve the measurement and the, and the tax apparatus around the business sector. Right? Ta taxing, taxing businesses in some sense, in, in, you know, not just in the US, but in many countries, is, a, is, is, is relatively efficient because there are relatively few of them relative to the dispersed you know, investor and ownership base. So that's another consideration which keeps you in the game of trying, I think, to think about the corporate side. There's a different world, of course, Sharon, in which we would just move to, say, a value-added tax and say that's the that's the way we're going to, to raise our revenue. And one of the questions in the in the chat actually asks this: you know, if, if we've moved from taxing the corporate to taxing sales, but we're con collecting the same share of revenue as a share of GDP, should we be worried about that? And you know, the, the there, there are two different questions there. One, you know, the corporate ownership is typically very concentrated at the top end of the distribution. So distributionally, corporate taxes look different than sales taxes. But uh, I think the basic point here, which is that you know, total revenue matters for some questions, composition of revenue matters for others, and then thinking about the structure of what we do at the corporate side is also key. And what do we think about distortions that come about because of, um, say, corporate taxes versus value-added taxes? Are there very different types of distortions that we need to worry about? You know, I think, I think there are a number of margins on which uh, there are likely to be distortions, right? Anytime you're trying to tax something called capital income, you're, 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 you enter into discussions of what's depreciation on physical assets or decay rates on intangible assets and things like that. So you may end up distorting the nature of the capital, tangible or intangible. Uh, we know that the effective tax rates on equipment and on structures and on inventories and on intangibles are different today. So we probably tweak uh, the, the margins of how businesses are doing that. The financial side, a topic, of course, of substantial interest to this group, uh, you know, debt versus equity remains a very important margin of distortion at this point where we still provide uh, deductibility for interest, but not for the compensation to equity owners. So that likely leads us to, you know, greater debt than otherwise. And of course, that play, play, plays right into some of the, the, the issues of financial stability that Jeremy was mentioning, uh, because if you're, if you're over levering the corporate sector relative to a new, neutral benchmark, right, you may, you may end up creating pressures, which then you need financial regulation to come back and try to address. Okay, I'm glad that you brought that up because this can bring into um, our discussion some issues that Jeremy raised. Um, and here's my big question, um, big picture question for Jeremy that relates to that. We see a financial sector that's very, very highly levered and it's very concentrated and we have deposit insurance. And because of those three factors, um, the sector has to be very, very highly regulated. And I guess my question is, um, why do we need those three ingredients? Um, I think taxes, to some extent, um, has biased the sector towards a lot more leverage. Um, so we're highly levered because uh, of corporate taxes, to some extent. And if I say that we raise very little revenue um, in the corporate sector um, in general, we raise almost no revenue in terms of relative to the size of the economy from the financial sector. And so we've got a lot of distortions with a very little revenue. Um, not clear why we need to have such big banks. And the thing that you were stressing in your discussion, Jeremy, was um, because we've got these players that are not well capitalized, um, the sector is a little bit less liquid than it should be, a lot less liquid than it should be. So, so I guess the question is, Jeremy, do you see a, a tax issue here um, where if we basically said that the banks didn't have to pay any taxes, um, would they still have this incentive to be highly levered and would they still need to be regulated in the way that they're regulated? Um, so good question, there's a lot, a lot, a lot in there. Um, let's see, I mean, I think I basically am sympathetic. I had a very similar kind of question for Jim, which is, you know, that the corporate tax doesn't raise much money. Uh, it seems like corporations are, you know, coalitions that are very efficient at, you know, tax evasion. 
Um, they have economies of scale and tax evasion and all that. So sort of sympathetic to the basic arguments that you're making. With that said, I don't think that it's not my, my instinct is not that the corporate tax as, as distortionary as it may be for leverage choices is the primary reason that we see highly levered financial intermediaries. There's something very different, right? If you look at corporate non-financial America, capital structure is all over the map, right? There's a tax advantage to debt everywhere. And yet we don't see firms in other industries. We often see a lot of dispersion in their leverage ratios, a lot of unlevered firms, a lot of, a lot of companies basically passing up the tax advantage of debt, whereas financial firms are always an everywhere kind of highly leveraged. So that suggests there's something going on. Um, and I'm going to venture that if you could find other sort of jurisdictions where the tax advantage to debt is not as pronounced, you'd still see financial intermediaries highly leveraged. Um, so that suggests there are other things going on. I think one of them is, is, uh, is simply that, like, it, what do financial intermediaries do? It's not just that they borrow. It's that they create these short-term sort of safe claims. So that's basically what financial intermediation is really about, is the creation of these short-term safe claims. That's their product. And so, you know, taxes or not, they're just going to be in the business of having a lot of short-term, a lot of short-term debt. And, you know, in a way, uh, I worry less about the um, bank sector. You know, you, you think of the sort of biggest problem as deposit insurance. Uh, deposit insurance has its issues, but once you have deposit insurance, at least the depositors are not so prone to run. I worry a lot about you know, situations outside the formal banking sector where we've recreated a basically short-term funding, short-term funding, and we don't have deposit insurance. And in fact, open-end funds, open-end loan funds kind of make my point perfectly. Because if you think about it, there's no tax advantage there. They're not corporations and it's not debt. You're a shareholder. You're a shareholder in a loan fund. Okay. Yet it has some of the same appeal, you know, is there really that big a difference between being like a repo lender against uh, a corporate bond or somebody who basically has a, a daily demandable claim? One is debt and one is equity. But in both cases, the investor, I think, reassures themselves with the knowledge or maybe just with the fiction that they can get out the next day and that that's like a really appealing thing. But that's what people like is, is sort of this ability to have daily demandability and to me, that is the essence of the financial sector. That is the essence of the sort of financial stability problem. And, you know, that's why it's so hard to regulate. It pops up in lots and lots of different, uh, lots and lots of different forms. But, but Jeremy, you stress the fact that like a money market fund, mm -hmm. um, there's no tax advantage to be levered and the money market funds, they're not levered. Um, so these are unlevered financial institutions. Right. And they provide safe debt. And we know in theory, you can have runs on money market funds, but in practice, that very rarely happens. Right. Um, so I, I want to be look, clear. I'm not thinking so much of money market funds. I'm thinking of like a, uh, a loan fund. Let's, you know, the assets are leveraged loans, relatively illiquid, longer term leveraged loans. And the liabilities are, you know, the equity in that bond fund. But you've got essentially, not exactly, again, because it's not a debt claim, but you've got essentially something that looks quite bank-like, right? Because the assets are illiquid loans and the liabilities are daily demandable. That's what the financial system wants to do, that sort of maturity and liquidity transformation, because people just like short-term claims, liquid claims. And so right. the money market fund is not doing it, but the, uh, the, the loan fund is. It's doing that kind of liquidity and maturity transformation and that wants to happen, I think, independent of deposit insurance, independent of tax advantages. That's kind of what the financial system likes okay. to do. But, but have we observed runs and problems of, I know potentially those can occur. Well, that but was- that, this, this have been a problem. That was my exact point. I mean, I think it's been a fragile structure. I think the underlying fragility may have grown because these things- as we have interestingly clamped down on formal short-term debt, right? It's morphed into this not technically short-term debt. Those kind of funds have grown dramatically. And my premise is if the Fed had not stepped in, I mean, we had outflows that were, you know, six standard deviations bigger than anything we had seen before. There was a lot of incipient worry that we were gonna see a complete meltdown of the sector. That is why the Fed stepped in. 
uh, as I said, you know, we didn't see the full um, distress that this could have caused. Um, and I think exactly industry is saying things like what you just said. Well, it wasn't that much of a problem. Everything turned out okay. Um, and I think I, I'm concerned that the urgency for reform will be, you know, mitigated by this. But I think it's a potentially, and, and maybe the sector will continue to grow, but I think it's a very real financial stability concern. And it's of the same nature that we, that we see kind of throughout all of finance. It's, you know, illiquid stuff financed by demandable liabilities. Okay, so so Tobias, are you seeing these same issues from your perspective at the IMF? Is this something that internationally people are worried about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, I'm in the uh, Financial Stability Board's uh, steering committee and and plenary, um, and uh, those are very much uh, topics that are uh, that are on on the discussion at the moment. So. Uh, there are four work streams uh, on regulatory reforms following the COVID crisis. Uh, so one is on money market funds. Uh, and uh, that is uh, because we saw again that money market funds and, and money markets more broadly, not just the funds, but the money markets were, were not functioning very well. Uh, the Fed and other central banks had to step in very quickly. And there's a feeling that uh, the reforms uh, of money market funds in 2015 were sort of like uh, only half, half, <laughs> only went halfway to where they should have gone. Uh, so a lot of proposals are already out there. You know, swing pricing is something that Jeremy uh, mentioned. Um, and uh, you know, one one key issue is is delinking uh, fees and gates um, uh, from. Um, uh, liquidity uh, requirements. So, so in the in the mutual fund industry, uh, you had uh, basically the uh, the breaching of liquidity requirements linked to imposing gates on investors, and that uh, generated run dynamics, and that is that is very well recognized as a problem. Secondly, open-ended funds more more generally are being looked at. Uh, again, swing pricing is is one thing there, but uh, there are many other aspects as well. Just adding on to, to Jeremy, what Jeremy said, you know, um, there are some uh, funds out there that don't offer daily liquidity. So uh, there are a number, a very small number of firms uh, that offer uh, mutual fund type products, so investment products that are not strictly mutual funds. So they don't offer daily li liquidity. Um, I think um, we've, we've frozen here. Is that the, correct? The dread uh, Zoom freeze. Okay. So uh, um, while he's frozen, maybe I'm going to toss the question uh, back to you. To you, Jim, in terms of taxes, but um, I want to think about carbon taxes. I just uh, want to get your input on carbon taxes while they, we unfreeze Tobias. They they look. Oh, maybe we're. Maybe he may be coming back in. Cup. Feel like it's a little like we're on Star Trek and we're trying to get him onto the transporter room. <laughs> yeah. We need to beam him back. <laughs> Investment. Okay. Well, so Jim, let's let's get your thoughts on um, carbon taxes and um, and why they're not working. I guess is really the question because most economists, I think, if you polled economists, um, very high percentage of them would say that carbon taxes make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think that's right, Sharon. Right. I I think that. My, my sense is there's a very high uh, favorability rating for carbon taxes for two reasons, right? I mean, one, we are in countries like the US, we are in a long-term structural deficit position that is gonna need revenue as we go forward. And uh, carbon taxes seem like a way to both generate revenue and try to better align the, the marginal social and the marginal private incentives, right? Associated with, uh, with energy use. And of course, there, you know, there can be an active debate about what the right social cost of carbon is and how you want to set these taxes. But I think on the principle of does it look like we should give the market agents the incentives to, to do whatever we think the, the social cost of carbon is and build that into their decision making and then let it run, uh, that seems very appealing. I think that the challenge with carbon tax and fr taxation, frankly, is a distributional one. Uh, it, is, it is really a concern that because 
Uh, the, you know, it, it, it works a, you know, like a sales tax to some degree, uh, that it will put high burdens on some low income uh, households. Uh, it, it it is you know and, and I think that's actually uh, it, it, unfortunately the the, pro the the political process around this is a prisoner of thinking about this tax in isolation, right? Because if you think about a carbon tax as part of a broader income tax cum carbon tax system, you can manage to uh, reduce the low income burden by changing the progressivity of your income tax in a way that tries to offset that. So uh, I, this, this, is, this is not a fundamentally difficult problem to solve as a matter of public economics, but it seems that it has been uh, you know, viewed as, as insoluble by the political process, which is unfortunate. I'm gonna say one other thing because there's been an active chat discussion, Pete Kyle in particular and, and a couple of others, uh, you know, on the, the comment I made a few minutes ago about what would happen if the, the corporate sector, in response to your question, became kind of like a, an IRA, uh, where people were just accumulating within the corporate sector. And we know that, you know, the, the assets in something like an individual retirement account, this is a, you know, a, a sort of EET type of, of uh, savings vehicle where you're contributing, uh, you know, contributing before tax, accumulating before tax, and then taxed on the back end. The, the, the difficulty in some sense, efficient as though that might seem as a way of, of trying to do business as a way of taxing the, the, these returns, right? Part of the challenge is that politically, I think people would then point to the assets that were being held in these corporate accumulation vehicles and say, there's no tax being collected here, right? And it's actually a fundamental problem between the, the, the analysis of a, uh, of a you know, deferred tax versus a uh, a, a sort of paid at the moment tax, right? So uh, the, the the notion that those who are you know are are sort of paying for or, or receiving income in the corporate sector are not paying anything at the moment looks very unattractive if you look at a static distribution table. But if you look at a longer term one, you get a very different result, assuming you can tax the income when, it's, when it comes out of the corporate sector. Okay, I think the same kind of distribution effect problem lies at the heart of trying to get the carbon tax on the table because. In isolation, when you just look at adding a carbon tax into any country's profile, it looks like it burdens folks who are lower in the income distribution relative to the very high end. Uh, whereas, in fact, the more a more, com a more either either combining that with a with an income tax you know component or thinking harder about the distributional analysis, right? Carbon taxes may have very significant effects on asset values, and uh, working through those those tend to hit at the top end of the distribution. That's a really interesting question to think about building off some of the kind of things that uh, you know, Tob Tob Tobias was saying before. Okay, is, is there a compliance um, issue in terms of carbon taxes? Is that hard to measure the carbon output of different firms and individuals? Or I, I know like a gasoline tax at the pump is very, very easy, but if I'm um, building a concrete building, um, is that difficult to calculate the carbon emissions and figure out the, you know, how it actually gets paid? I'm going, to, I'm going to wander out on a, on a plank here, Sheridan, and I may not know enough to know that I'm about to fall off uh, and say, I think it's actually pretty easy because as long as you can do taxation at, at mine mouth or wellhead for a lot of the fossil fuels, right, you can actually manage to get the taxes in place there, right? So, you know, you, since, since most of this is sort of upstream, there are relatively few sources uh, you can manage to get the, the prices into the system relatively straight in a straightforward way. Now, in a global world where you have to do border adjustment and things like that, uh, it becomes more complicated. And of course, Europe has just begun to take some steps in this direction. The U.S. has made some, some noises in this area, right? You know, when we know that power generation, cement production, and steel are the three most important industries in terms of their, of their carbon content and, and, and carbon emissions, Right, then figuring out what the embodied steel or the embodied cement that was used along the production chain or the embodied electricity right, in products that you're importing suddenly becomes a big deal. And you get to exactly what Tobias was talking about earlier, uh, which is the difficulties of figuring out how do you do measurement, not, along, not just for corporate reporting, but now for product specific tariffs in some sense that you're trying to tax at the border. So that's a very complicated set of issues. Okay, and so I, I think we have to, Tobias, um back with us and, and maybe he should be the one to answer this last question I have is it's, it's more philosophical. Um, I'm a little concerned that we, we all understand what the 
appropriate economic solution is, which is a carbon tax. Um, and then we're very loosely saying politically, that's not tenable. Um, so we're basically talking about using the financial system to, in some sense, distort the will of the people. Um, it seems very anti-democratic to basically say the median voter doesn't care about the climate. Um, the financial elites, we care a lot about the climate. Um, we're going to do various things to distort um, policy um, because politically we can't get our way. I'm just curious whether you, um, to, to be us in, in particular and um, the others here have any view of, of that argument. See if we can fascinating argument. I had never heard it before. I, I, you're, so you're saying, you know, um, uh, democracy is, is equal weighted and financial markets are value weighted. As well, the financial markets are controlled by very wealthy yeah. elites and um, we're all very wealthy elites that worry about the climate, but the median voter doesn't seem to be worried about the climate. And so we're basically saying, you know, who cares about the median voter? Um, you know, this is what we think is the right decision. So we're going to distort financial markets in a way that basically moves policy in the direction that we think it should be moved, even though the democratic solution is very different. I'm, I'm hoping that Tobias is, Tobias is coming back in at this point uh, and can jump in on that question. You know, but I, I will just say, Sheridan, it, it, it comes to a comment that also is in the in the chat that Pete Kyle has has raised about assigning government ownership shares. Um, your point that the you know the, the capital markets and the and let's say the the, the political system or I'll, I'll say the tax system, uh, you know, share risks in different ways is 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 a point that for the group of our students who are are, are, are listening this morning, I think is an important one to underscore. Right. I mean, think think about the problem of climate risk for a moment, and how we allocate climate risk in different ways. If the if climate risk is going to be bailed out by public insurance, right? That you know, government insurance, FEMA, things like that, then ultimately we're allocating that risk through the tax system. Right. We're paying for it in whatever way we pay taxes. Right. And of course, you know, the U.S. income tax system is is not a, a poll tax. Right. I mean, something something like 40% of the income taxes in the US are paid by the top 1% of the, of the taxpayers. And the bottom half of the US income distribution pays very little in income taxes, although they pay payroll taxes and sales taxes and other taxes. Uh, but uh, you know, contrast that allocation of risk, uh, whatever it is through the tax system, with what happens if you relied on private insurance markets, which would, you know, I'll, I'll characterize them. Imagine that private insurance markets look like the equity market or even more extreme like Lloyd's of London. Right? Then you, you basically are pushing the, the risk bearing through reinsurance markets and elsewhere onto those in the, in the global economy who have revealed a preference for taking on risk for whatever this return might be. So I think there's a really interesting question about risk sharing and risk bearing in, in, in the economy. And, and it really comes down to, uh, you know, do you think that the, the private allocation of risk is ultimately more efficient than the allocation through the, the tax system? There's a flip argument here, uh, which is uh, you know, goes back to a point that, that, that Ken Arrow and, and, and Lind made in the early 1970s that said, as long as you divvy up the risk in a small enough, in a small enough packets, right, then essentially there's no, there's no price for the risk. There's no charge for the risk if you're doing it. So if you can spread the risk out over all of the taxpayers in the US or all the global taxpayers, everyone's getting just such a small piece, we don't charge for risk. That, that argument, you know, while, while true in the context they made it, if the risk is correlated with aggregate shocks or other things, it, it, you know, we, it looks much more like a consumption cap M pricing than, than, than their zero risk price. And it raises some interesting questions, I think, for the, the public finance of these risk issues. Tobias, welcome back. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we can um, get Tobias. That's uh, okay. Um, Scott, are there questions from the chat and the Q and A that we should be addressing now? 
I'd like to there, open it up. There, to are, there are a lot of questions, and I think each of the panelists um, yeah, have taken a I'm, look. So I'm very sorry. It doesn't seem to be in front of the cell phone. It sounds like Tobias is having connectivity issues still. Um, in terms of the questions, I don't know, maybe we can just turn to Jeremy and Jim to kind of aggregate responses to the high number of questions that we've received. Would that be possible? Sure. Uh, yeah, let, let me, uh, Jeremy, do you want to start? I'll, then I'll follow yeah, you. Yeah, I see one from Chester Spad about whether swing pricing should be mandatory. Um, because you know it's always an option, and 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 he's pointing out that that if it's voluntary, there may not be much take up. I think, I think absolutely yes. If you think that swing pricing is a valuable thing, I think it's likely to be that you have to mandate it because um, it is sort of a natural problem that every every individual fund is going to want to promise as much open ending and as much. Um, you know, sort of liquidity, if you will, to their to their shareholders as possible. And there's a bit of a public good, which is if we stem kind of outflows from one fund, we're stemming um, kind of price pressure on other funds as well. So I think I think it probably makes sense to to have it be mandatory. Again, I just just to reiterate, I'm not sure. I think it's it's good, and I'm glad that the FSB and others are thinking about swing pricing. I'm not sure. I'm not confident that that alone will. Um, Will will go a very long way towards towards solving the kind of problems that we're uh, discussing. Yeah, let, let me jump in on on two things, Sheridan. One, um, since we since we unfortunately have lost Tobias, I just want to come back to his comment on uh, ESG disclosure and trying to, to to simplify and systematize this because I think that that's a really important comment. And you know, I've I've seen a number of contexts, whether from the business side or from the investor side, where there is there's really substantial interest, as as Tobias was explaining, in trying to develop standards that people can actually use uh, for measuring corporate activities and and other activities uh, that provide guidance to firms. Right? If we think about the risks that firms are facing at the moment, there's the there's the aggregate climate risk that changes their business model, but then there's also regulatory risk of of how the definitions will be used and, and whatnot. Uh, and that's an important part. I think, I think maybe Tobias, you look like you're back in. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop and pass the baton to you for a bit. And you're gonna have to keep the baton, Jim. You know, right, I'm, gonna, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep the baton. Uh, in that case, I'm gonna come back to the to some of the, the tax discussion. And uh, you know, there's a very interesting suggestion in the chat uh, that one way to address this issue, how do you share the, 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 the wealth gains within, a, within an IRA type corporation or LLC uh, is you assign a, a wealth share to the government. You basically give the government an ownership share. And uh, that way, you know, it's it's a, it's a part beneficiary of the accumulation of these assets as, as an inside basis. And that that's a really you know, it's, it's a it's a neat insight that comes from finance to think about these tax issues, right? I mean, think about at some very basic level. We you know most of us have four hundred one k plans or IRAs, and you know the government is essentially because we've got deferred tax liabilities there. The government's a partner in, in those investments, right? You know, many of us will pay 30, 40% on the withdrawals from those plans. Uh, so there's a deferred tax asset that the government has, and it doesn't show up on the balance sheet of the government. You know, but if, if we were doing our personal balance sheets the right way, it sure should show up for us, right? Your $100,000 in your IRA is not the same as $100,000 in your after-tax money market fund because the IRA has to be pulled out and you have to give some substantial share of that to the government, right? So recognizing that raises a whole host of interesting possibilities when you begin to think about, you know, what are you doing when you've got this government partner? Uh, you know, for example, Steve Zeldis and, and some collaborators have worked on the question of, uh, do, do we want the government to have deferred tax assets which are invested the way investors, uh, you know, hold them in their, in their IRAs and 401ks, paying whatever expense ratios they are on them uh, in, in return for the government getting those, those taxes later on. But I think there are also questions around, 
how one would, uh, would think about uh, using this kind of government ownership stake as an offset to a corporate income tax, right? And the, the, the challenge would be, how do you get this set up at the beginning, right? It would be, you know, if, if Sheridan and I decide to, in, to, to set up a little LLC, which is gonna provide, you know, tax planning advice or something, uh, there have to be some, you know, the, the initial conditions would have to be set in such a way that uh, something like the government is receiving a, a share of whatever revenue is gonna be generated within the LLC. Okay, or would have an ownership stake of, of stock in, in, or, or shares that it could cash out. Once you start to go down that route, right, you, 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 you can see that you open up the, 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 the can of worms, which is you know, financial planning and, and tax planning issues, right? Uh, the kind that would say you try to undervalue the government's claim by making your revenues look small at the moment, but in the few, and then you, you, you sort of try to close the enterprise, but there's something left over for the, the beneficiaries. You do a variety of things which might get complicated and require some tax enforcement. So I think these are issues that are really interesting to think about. Uh, I've long been a believer that the intersection between financial economics and public finance is a really rich area uh, for research. It's, it's understudied, because for reasons having to do with the sociology of our fields, the people who work in those two places have kind of drifted into different camps. But it's a, it's a very good place to bring the insights from financial economics and risk bearing to think about a lot of questions in the public sector. Can I ask you just to follow up very briefly on that insight? Um, I would think that as a PhD student, a cross country study would be something worth doing. Are people looking at different countries with different um, tax regimes? And they ask, you know, which ones seem to be working better, and what do we learn from those studies? You know, it's a it's a great question, Sharon, and it'll give me a little chance. And we're you know we're closing out on our time here, but to to, to sermonize for just a second, right? The question you've just raised is a really important one. You know, understanding at some broad level how different tax systems influence the nature of business and financial activity across countries. Uh, for better or for worse, a lot of the emphasis these days is on more granular data, more administrative data, more focusing on you know, the reform to a particular regime within a particular country where we have some companies or some banks or some who are affected by one thing and not by the other. Uh, and and that, that may well be a good direction for us to be going. We, we, we do learn a lot from those carefully controlled studies. But I think one thing it, it somehow shifts our look, our gaze from to some degree is we don't pay as much time looking at these macro differences and asking questions, for example, you know, gee, why is it that the debt equity ratio is very different in Germany, Japan, the US uh, and the UK? What explains that, right? And, uh, you know, is that, is that things having to do with the financial structure of the banking system and other things? Is it having to do with the tax system? Is it having to do with regulation? What explains changes to the number of companies that go public in the US over time, right? Uh, you know, we, we know that that's, ch that's changed a lot. Uh, is that due to regulation? We, we don't have a control and, a, and, a, and an experiment, a, a, you know, control and experimental that we can look at there. But these are, these are pretty important questions for, uh, for policy and for financial markets. And it's important for us not to forget them. No, I think it's extremely important. They're, if you look at the, you know, the, the, the largest new companies that have formed um, in, the, in the world over the last 50 years, almost none of those companies are in Europe. And the question is, why is that? And, and I guess the second question is, does it matter? Germany is doing just fine, um, even though there's no new companies being created in Germany. Um, that's a, an issue I think that does need to be studied a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jeremy, any last thoughts before we break? We have only a couple of minutes. Yeah, I would just actually echo uh, Jim's Jim's last set of comments there. I mean, it's it's very much something that you will face as a PhD student is you know a, a sense of this is sort of you know it's it, you often get advice that's not so much about research but about kind of succeeding in the profession, and you know here's the kind of paper you should write if you want to get a good job, and here's the kind of paper you should write if you want to get it published in this in this journal. And it has to look like this, and it has to have, you know, uh, regression discontinuity and all of that. And look, and, and that advice is correct in some sense of the word, right? I mean, there's a reason you get the advice, and it's true. But I think often the ability to resist that, at least in part, and to think about the reason you went to graduate school in the first place and the, the broad questions that you were interested in, 
you know, it's, it's a very, I, I, I think it's a very important part of sort of becoming a researcher is, is, is at least to some extent resisting and, and trying to stay focused and asking yourself, you know, not what is the best uh, project to get myself to the next step, but what is really kind of interesting and important. So uh, I just, I'm, I'm glad Jim, Jim mentioned that and just, just kind of uh, echo it. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I'm hoping that Tobias will have the last word, but I'm not um, convinced that this is going to work. So, um, um, Tobias. The, uh, sorry, my connection seems to be very bad. Um, and I, I only listened to some of the conversations. So, you know, on, on, on the climate issue, um, I, I would fully agree with, um, with Jim's point that the interaction of public policy, uh, fiscal policy, uh, and tax policy, and and financial markets uh, is is very much understudied and is very first order, in particular with respect to this climate finance uh, uh, issue. I think there there are many uh, adverse but also positive feedback loops uh, that we can uh, think about in climate finance, and uh, and hopefully capital markets will make a difference in the in the positive sense. Uh, so let me stop here. It's certainly a very rich, rich area to study. Let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the entire panel. I always enjoy talking to you guys. Um, hopefully we can do this again next year. Um, Scott, do you have any last words before we move on? Yeah, thanks for the terrific discussion. I just say uh, to the students, you've got a 15 minute break and then you need to self-select into one of four special tracks and you should have the links and we look forward to seeing you in those sessions and uh thanks again everybody for this terrific panel great okay thank you right. take thanks. care